so much of how you live today is based on what you know about tomorrow. That became very clear for me this last week, uh, spring break week. We were planning a little family getaway to Chicago, but a little over a week ago, we looked at the weather forecast for Chicago, and it was going to be cold and rainy, and while we weren't going there for the beaches, we still decided, let's, let's do something else. And so kind of last minute, Amy was looking up plane tickets, just where could we go? And, and she found tickets to Orlando, Florida, where the five of us could have gone round trip for a grand total of $500, probably closer to $800 once you build in baggage and all that fun stuff. But still, like we were three breaths away from clicking purchase when one of us had the idea, well, let's just see how nice it's going to be there you know, Florida. And so we looked up the weather forecast and it was eerily similar to Chicago. <laughs> One nice day, sunny, but then after that, cold, rainy. We were going there for the beaches. And so we decided to do a staycation instead. And we had the most lovely staycation week ever and our dog really appreciated it too. But have you ever found that in your life where so much of how you live today is based on what you know about tomorrow? And how much more true is that when it comes to your view of the end of the world? I remember back in 1997, there was a group of people called Heaven's Gate Cult who believed that for them, the end of the world meant that they would all together die on the same day so that they could be taken up to the comet hale -Bopp. And so, of course, this made national news as people were left scratching their heads. How could they do something like this? But, but what they did that day was because of what they thought they knew about tomorrow. And the same is true of all of us. One of the most important things for us to know is what God tells us about tomorrow and specifically what he tells us about the end of the world. Now, what I know is that based on what I see, there can be so much fear around this. Oh, it's the end of the world. Oh, it's the end of the world. And, and, and even in recent times, I've seen social media influencers quoting scripture and then alongside it comparing to what they see in the world. And they say, see, the end is here. You should not go see the solar eclipse. You should not go here. You and, and, and it's alarmist and it's filled with fear. And that gets attention. In some cases, unfortunately, that gets money. But did you know that Jesus talked about the end of the world? Not to get money, not to scare people, but rather Jesus talked about the end because he wanted to prepare people, not scare them. He didn't sound alarmist. In fact, he tells them, don't be alarmed. But in the process of telling them what tomorrow will bring, he knew that would shape how we live today. So what do you know about tomorrow? What do you know about the end of the world? And how has that knowledge been shaping how you live today? Today we're beginning a series called End of the World where we're diving into this very deep, mysterious, curious topic of the end of the world. And while there are many things we could talk about and many things we could say, this isn't it, this isn't it, this isn't it, what we're going to do is simply open scripture and let Jesus show us what it is, what we can know, what we do know about the end. Because what we know about tomorrow shapes how we live today. So today we're going to start in Matthew chapter 24, where Jesus gives a very long answer about a question concerning the end of the world. Uh, but before you get to Matthew chapter 24, it's worth noting that Jesus has talked about this uh, at least several times before this day. Uh, what we see in Matthew 13 and Matthew 16 is that Jesus has been sprinkling this idea throughout his entire ministry. In Matthew 13, he started talking about this thing called the end of the age, like the end of life as we know it that at a certain point, something new will kick in, a new age, a new kingdom. And so in Matthew 13, he starts talking about that. And, and he starts uh, talking about 
parables, like weeds among the wheat. And in this parable, the people ask, should we pull the weeds or what should we do with them? And the person in the parable says, no, don't pull the weeds because it'll pull up the wheat along with them. Leave them both until harvest. Then first we'll pick up the weeds, throw them away, and then we'll gather the wheat and put it to its place. And Jesus said, this is how it will be at the end of the age. Matthew 16, same thing. The coming of the Son of Man will mean a judgment. And and that's where God will divide people. And so he's been talking about these things for some time. And then we get to to Matthew chapter 24. And, And what just happened is Jesus walked through Jerusalem with his disciples, and they did what I would have done in Chicago. They pointed up all the buildings and they said, Jesus, look at that. Look how big it is. How long do you think it took them to build that one? And specifically, they looked at the temple and they said, how amazing is this temple? Just single blocks weighing tons and tons and tons. And and it was an amazing architectural achievement. And they were so amazed. And then Jesus looks at them and he says, hold on. That whole thing's going to be destroyed. It will be reduced to rubble. Not two stones will be left on one another. And that shocked them. They had also heard Jesus say that he would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. And so they're making these connections. Maybe that's the end of the age. Maybe the destruction of the temple will mark his coming as king over a new kingdom. And they still didn't understand what that meant. And so once they had wandered out of Jerusalem and they were in a quiet place, they approached him privately. And one of them was brave enough to ask a question. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, quietly. Tell us, they said, when will this, the destruction of the temple, happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Lots of questions all rolled up into one. A very complicated, compound question. And often what Jesus did with questions was he would return a question with a question. Uh, Sometimes he would say, well, what do you think? Or what have you read? Or what do the scriptures say? But instead of replying with a question, Jesus replies with an answer. He said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Because when it comes to this fear of the end of the world, it's so easy to be deceived and led astray. It's so easy to be alarmist and for people to say, see, the prophecy is happening. Don't be deceived. And then he goes on to explain to them, there, there will be many who come in my name, claiming to be the Messiah, claiming to be me, and they will deceive many. Uh, We can even see in the first century of how some of this started to unfold. People claimed to be the Messiah. All the way until last century, we can see very public figures claiming to be the Christ, the Messiah. Jesus said, don't be deceived. When it comes to my coming, there will be people that try to deceive you. And then he goes on to say, not only will will people try to deceive you, but there will be things that distract you from the end. He goes on to say this. He says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, and I'll fill in the gaps in just a little bit. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. This world will just feel like it's crumbling apart. And people will say, this must be the end. And there there might be even some forms of evil where, where people will say, how can God stand this anymore? You know, for me as a parent, there, there's a certain threshold I reach. You know, what, kids are arguing a little bit, fine. But once the decibel level reaches a certain point, I walk in the room and I say, we're done. Whatever we're fighting over, I'm taking it. No more Wi-Fi. Like, I just step in and, and just lay it all down. And, and some people think, well, doesn't God do that too? We hear about these evils in this world and we're like, oh, God is going to show up and he's going to put an end to all of this. And that's what we naturally think. Here's what Jesus said, though. You'll hear about wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Alarm, maybe another way we could talk about that today, is don't be anxious. Anxiety is the result of what you don't know about tomorrow, but you think could happen tomorrow. Anxiety flows over, alarm flows over in the presence of uncertainty. Jesus said, don't be alarmed. Such things must happen. Here's the important part. 
the end is still to come. In other words, that's not the end. Wars, rumors of wars, they're not the end. The end is still to come. Likewise, he said, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be horrible things, famines, earthquakes. People will be wondering, is this God's judgment on the earth? But Jesus says, all these are just the beginning of birth pains or severe pains. That's not the end. That's just the beginning. And you're like, oh, good. <laughs> but what Jesus is doing is he's, he's aligning us to say, no, these things that alarm you and distract you, don't pay attention to that. These earthquakes, these famines, these wars, all the, the, the rumors that you hear out there, don't let that alarm you. That's not the end. So how we put this all together is that catastrophes, wars, rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes, they're reminders that the end is coming. They are reminders that this world has been broken to its core, and this is not the way God designed it to be. These are reminders that the end is coming, but they're not signs that the end is here. Rather, what Jesus then goes on to, to explain is that when the end comes, it won't be a gradual unraveling, but there will be something that happens immediately and unmistakably. But before we get to that, what Jesus was telling his disciples is a little bit complicated because as he goes on, he tells them things that apply only to them and no longer to us today. And the best way I've heard this described is when, when sometimes in, in the Bible, when there are certain prophecies, it's like God is describing a mountain range that's way ahead of you. And if you've ever been to Colorado or a place where there's this big line of mountain ranges, Buck Hill does not count. <laughs> Off in the distance, it looks like one solid canvas. And you can even look at the mountains and say, see how that one is shaped that way? That's how we know it's this mountain. And to see that little crevice there, that's how we know that it's this mountain. And so from a distance, you can recognize them. But what happens as you get closer? You realize that the mountains that all seem flat, now they're complicated. There's different series of them. First, there's the first one. Then there's more that come later. And then there's the faraway ones that seemed close at first. And that's what, prophecy, what, what happens in prophecy quite often in Scripture. It paints one picture, but then as you progress through history, you see there are certain prophecies that happen now, some that happen later, and then the ultimate fulfillment happens at the end. So when the disciples asked, when is the end coming? When will the temple be destroyed? Jesus said, okay, there's three different things you need to remember. Number one, and you can read through all of Matthew 24 to see this. He says, first of all, you guys are going to be persecuted and put to death. So for them... That's what the end looked like. Then he talked about the temple. He talked about how it would be destroyed. And in the, the year AD 70, Titus did just that. The temple was completely destroyed. It was burned so severely that the gold melted into all the cracks of the bricks and the stones. And so they destroyed every stone, pulling out as much gold as they could. Not two stones were left on top of one another. So Jesus predicted that. He prophesied that, and it happened. And then there's the bigger picture. What about his coming? What about his kingdom that he's going to establish? And that's where we pick things up. It might help with a, a timeline, just to kind of picture what all Jesus is talking about here. And so I'll, I'll just reference what's on the screen briefly. So as you think about a timeline, again, going left to right, uh, do we have the picture? There we go. So this is like the beginning of time on the left. Here's the end of time on the right. Uh, the cross, I'm, I'm a simple guy. The cross represents Jesus. That, that's when he came. That's when he died. That's when he rose again and ascended into heaven. And Jesus is telling his disciples what's going to happen at the end. And what he points to is what happens right after he's gone. Right after he's gone, he says, you will be persecuted. You will be put to death. And then he points a little bit further, and he, he talks about the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem. But then what he does is he talks about this entire time in between. We can expect famines, earthquakes, wars, rumors of wars, horrible things. But that's not the end. We're just in the end times. Finally, there will come a day. When the Son of Man returns, and this is what Jesus taught. He taught that just as he came once, he will come a second time. The second time, not in humility as a baby, but as the King of kings and as the judge of all people. 
And so Jesus says, immediately after this, when the end times are done, when, when I decide that they're done, next verse, Jesus says, immediately after the distress of those days, those end times, he quotes Isaiah, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall out of the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. This is poetic imagery of what that day will be like. And that's the best that Jesus could point back to in his state as a human being living among us. He looked back at scripture and he says, here's what we can see about the end of that day. Because in his humanity, he had set aside all of his um, divine wisdom. And he said, I'm not going to make use of that. And maybe it's because no human being can possibly comprehend the end. For whatever reason, he set aside that knowledge and he said, I'll just use what scripture has revealed to me. And here's what Isaiah poetically said that day will be like. We turn to Luke and he adds a little flavor to it. He says, there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and the tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. This world, this creation, on a certain day, it's like it'll all fall apart. And Jesus, he's telling you, it'll be obvious. And then, then the important part, then there will be the sign of the Son of Man. Next verse. There will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then all the peoples of the earth will mourn. We'll we'll talk about that in a moment. They will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Why will they mourn? And are we included among the mourners? More on that in a bit. Going back to Luke, focused on different details as he heard Jesus. Luke said this, when when these things begin to take place, Jesus said, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. This will be an incredible day that I don't have the words to describe to you because all scripture provides to us is a poetic image of what that day will be like. But we know it'll be obvious. It'll be sudden. It'll be so sudden to the point where when people see it happening, they will say, it's over. This is it. What Jesus wanted his disciples to know is that when this day happens, they shouldn't cower in fear. They shouldn't run and be afraid but rather they should lift up their heads because their redemption is drawing near. The same is true for you. Jesus says what you should know about tomorrow, about the end, whenever it may come, is that the best is yet to come. Now think about your life and some of the things that, you know, perfect week, what would you do? Uh, For some of you, it's getting together with family members, and you say, I just love family gatherings, you know, for two days, and then after that, it got to go our separate ways, but you're like, I love family gatherings. As much as you love that, Jesus would say, the best is yet to come. If you love seeing your grandkids, great-grandkids, playing sports, doing their musicals, whatever it is, if, if that's like the thing you look forward to, Jesus would say, That's good, but the best is yet to come. If you have a certain hobby or pastime, like if you're just out on the lake all summer long, just catching fish, and that's heaven for you, Jesus would lean in and say, that's good. I did that with my disciples, but the best is yet to come. If you get paid for doing what you love to do, and you're like, this is the life, Jesus would say, I had a rewarding life too, but the best is yet to come. The part we have to be careful with is when we stop believing that. And the caution Jesus would give us is to search our own hearts. Perhaps part of you will be labeled among the mourners on that day. Mourning because the old order of things is passing away, but there's something about the old order of things that you have set your life and your heart on. There's part of your identity that's tied up into your everyday life. And so when when this life is over, there will be mourning. Part of your identity is tied up in your your job, your career, your your family, your friends. And and if that were taken away from you, this this side of Jesus coming to take it all away might, might cause mourning. 
And so this is an, an invitation from Jesus to think through this and say, okay, if I really believe the best is yet to come, what does that say about where my heart should be today? Because how you live today is so shaped by what you know about tomorrow. And some might say, well, how do, we, how do we know when it will be? Will it be tomorrow? Could it be this week? Could it be this month? And Jesus, knowing the questions, answered them. About that day, about that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son. And remember, speaking from his uh, place as being fully human in this moment, uh, getting, setting aside all of his divine wisdom, and just he's quoting scripture. That's how he's teaching them. He's quoting from the scripture. He says, not even I know, because scripture has not told us. Only the Father. And then to help us grasp what this means, he gives a parable, a story. He says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Now, days of Noah, Noah is the one who built the big ark, and the flood came, and Noah and his family and the animals were kept safe. Jesus says it's, there's a similarity to what will happen at the end. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage, some of you know how much planning a wedding takes, people were planning marriages that never happened. All that work, there was mourning. And up to that day, Noah entered the ark, all these things were going on. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. Now, as we read this next verse, just keep in mind, Jesus is, is focusing on one specific detail. When. And what he wants us to know is that it will be unexpected. So he's not describing how it will happen or what we'll see when it will happen. He's describing the immediacy and the, the unknown nature of when it will happen. He says, just as it was then, that's how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one taken. And remember, with the flood, the, to be taken away was not the good thing, that was to be destroyed. Jesus says, on that day, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken, the other left. Both of them had no idea it was coming. And, and you would think, if, if I knew the end of the world was coming, like, I don't know, maybe we'd have a special prayer service. We'd all be gathered here at North Cross. We'd have overflow seating. Like, we would all be here focused on God. But Jesus says, no, on that day, you'll be doing your normal business. Some will be taken, others left. Some sent to destruction, some sent to eternal life. And next week, we'll talk more about that division and how that judgment happens. But for now, Jesus is emphasizing, nobody knows. Nobody knows. So what do we do with that? What do you do when you know something is coming up, but you have no idea when it will be? Here, Jesus gives us the application. He says, therefore, keep watch. Because you don't know on what day your Lord will come. So, so you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So keep watch. Be ready. And over the years, many godly people have, have looked at these revelations and looked at what Jesus said. And many of them have been convinced that the time is near, including people today. Check out this quote from a person that's a lot smarter than I am. There is no need for a special gift of prophecy to recognize how these revelations are being fulfilled before our very eyes. In other words, it's obvious to everyone that the world is in, in such a place that the end is just around the corner. It could be this week. It could be next month. But it's, it's close. Um, guess who, who said this? John Meyer, who died in 1964. Um, another quote, some perhaps even more smarter, uh, smarter, um, someone with definitely more influence. He said, now that the end of the world is approaching, the people rage and rave most horribly against God. The fact that God can tolerate such a thing is a sign that the day is not far off. And maybe you've been looking at the world around you and you're like, oh, things are getting so bad. How can God stand this anymore? Certainly he's going to storm in and put everything to an end. Guess who said this? Martin Luther in the 1500s. 
We can even look back to what the apostles wrote in the New Testament, Peter and, and Paul. And they told people, based on what we see, the end is near. It's, it's coming. Here's the funny thing. Christians and godly people in every generation have thought that the end is here. Every generation thinks the end is here. Only one will be right. Will it be your generation? How do you know? Well, our job, as Jesus said, is simply to keep watch. Keep watch and prepare. And part of that includes preparing the next generation. And here's a really important, like, this isn't a parenting series, but this is such a big part of parenting. There are so many things in, in our kids' lives that are good. Remember that. There's so many things that are good. But what does it look like to raise them in such a way that you teach them that the best is yet to come? We can do good things. Let's not let that distract us from the best things. And each parent is called by God to make that decision and to take that role in their kids' lives, not just to let them do whatever they want to do, but let's pursue some good things while also remembering the day is coming. It could be near. And I don't want my kids to mourn on that day. I want them to lift up their heads and say the best is yet to come. And so our job is to keep watch. Our job is to prepare the next generation. And, and some of you at this point, you, 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 might, you might have some questions still, and I'm sure you do. You might even have some doubts because you're not sure this day will be a good day for you because you know what God knows about you. And you wonder, you might wonder, can God possibly welcome someone like me to be with him. I'm not sure this is a day I want to watch for. Maybe I just want to distract myself with life and distract myself with my career and distract myself with fun and make it numb so I don't have to think about that day. But, but I want, what I want you to know is that all of us have this day to look forward to because this isn't the first time God is sending his son into the world. He already sent him a first time, not as a mighty judge to rule the nations, but as a humble servant taking your place in death. And he did that for people like you, for people like me. So that knowing that our sins are forgiven, we have life with him. And just keep this in mind. You might say, well, I know what God knows. What God wants you to know is that he has so thoroughly forgiven your sin that he forgets what was past. Jesus so thoroughly forgave your sins that God forgets who you were. And if there's still any doubt in your mind about how God views you or what he thinks about you, I hope you can come back next week to part two of End of the World, if there is a part two. Because we're going to talk about that thing called Judgment Day. How does God decide who's in and who's out? And we're going to see it all leads back to Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, as long as we are alive in this world that's broken by sin, we will have questions about what you're up to and when that final day will be. There's so many different ways we could let ourselves become obsessed with this topic to the point where it, it takes all of our energy and focus in an unhealthy way. So would you do for us what only you can do to, to give us your wisdom to be able to approach this topic with, with curiosity, yet not with so much curiosity that it takes us over. To want to know about what we should know about the end, but not to be overwhelmed by it. In the end, there are so many things that we could know about that day that we don't know. But at the end of the day, it's all about who we know. And that is Jesus. So direct our attention, our faith, our trust toward him. For he has changed everything for us. We pray this all in his name. Amen.